This is Sports Crash, an in-depth look at thrill seekers taking it to the limit. We break it down and take you inside the action. Buckle up. Plymouth, England, home of the World Powerboat Championships. 10 UIM Class 1 powerboats are competing for the top prize of the Honda British Grand Prix. Spectacularly skimming across the waves, these muscle marine machines can reach speeds up to 180 miles per hour as they navigate their way around the 18-lap course. This is the series where all the wealthiest come to play. These boats can be worth in excess of one to two million dollars each. Powerboat racing legend Chris Parsonage and Honda Formula Four-stroke champion James Shepard are about to find out just how quickly disaster can strike. Pushing the limits of their number 50 King of Shaves vessel, they find themselves gaining on the leaders. Last lap, three minutes, 4.11 seconds, and that's almost a second quicker than the race leader. These intrepid water warriors are positioning themselves with a winning plan, to shoot to the front of the pack when the timing is right, but nothing can prepare them for what happens next. Trying, that's all right, Spirit's gonna mash him up here. This is over 270 kilometers an hour. Oh, that is absolutely massive. King of Shades has crashed. The rough waters jostle the boat off course. The men lose control of the craft, and in a terrifying split second, they flip over. Here's what the mayhem looks like in our Anatomy of a Sports Crash. Traveling at over 168 miles per hour, Parsonage and Shepard try to navigate through the two wakes left by the leaders. The turbulence rocks them helpless, tossing their five-ton boat like a cork on the sea. From the crest of a wave to the murky Plymouth depths in less than two seconds. A horrific accident to be sure, but the real disaster may be happening below the surface. In 50 feet of numbing ice-cold 40-degree water, Shepard and Parsonage are in a fight for their lives. Shepard emerges first in the safety shell, desperately checking to see if Parsonage is free of his straps. The rescue crew descends on the scene, hoping the men can surface in time. This is absolutely incredible. The endless seconds, waiting for help to arrive, holding your breath, and then checking your buddy is okay, undoing your straps before making your escape together. Finally, the men can breathe easy, fortunate to have any breath left at all. There's Parsonage returning. His dream is shattered. So we'd have rather ended up on the podium in first place, but uh, you know, accidents happen and there goes. Accidents do happen, and so do sports crashes. And in the high-speed world of pushing powerboats to the limit, any crash you can swim away from is a good one. Snowmobile racing is the ultimate high-speed, daring test of man, technology, and nature. 650-pound, 500-horsepower chrome chariots scream around an icy, slick layout. Piloted by fierce competitors, trying to guide their revved-up super sleds to victory. It takes years to acquire the experience to successfully compete in this dangerous sport. At Michigan's Pontiac Silverdome, Don Letty, a carpenter by trade, is in only his second race. But he'll soon receive a lifetime of experience in a split second. As the racers take off, they jockey for early position. Then, at the first jump, Letty learns a very important law of physics. No two objects can occupy the same space at the same time. We have got some damaged sleds. In a disastrous blink of an eye, Don finds himself bombarded by hundreds of pounds of churning metal. Here's how it looks as we make our crash scene investigation. At 35 miles per hour, Letty's green sled soars three feet over the first jump. But as he lands, another snowmobile two feet above him loses control. A 650-pound sled with a mind-numbing 8,500 RPM motor and an 85-mile-per-hour traction belt lands spinning on Letty's head. It knocks Don to the snow and directly in the path of this other sled here. 
It's two brutal crushing blows to the body. As the rescue team rushes to his aid, Don lies motionless in the snow, fearing he's done permanent damage to himself. At first, the dazed driver can't feel his legs, not knowing whether they're broken or not. But after several tense moments, Don's able to rise to his feet. Amazingly, he escapes with just some bruises and soreness. After such a horrific crash, he's lucky to be alive, having survived his first crash in competition. A crash he'll be replaying in his head forever. Coming up on Sports Crash, a terrible spill at the track, and a skier makes the wrong decision. That's up next. Welcome back to Sports Crash, where we give you an up close and analytical look at the most spectacular crashes in sports. Stunt skiers, they're an adrenaline pumping breed apart. Whether defying gravity, pushing the limits of athleticism, or just breaking the laws of physics, these big air junkies constantly test their awesome abilities as they perfect their considerable skills. No one spends more time on the slopes at California's Big Bear Mountain than Scott Hibbert. After having suffered several massive blows to the head in competition, today, Scott is tackling what appears to be a tamer stunt, a jib. A jib is basically just a metal rail that you slide across. Rail sliding requires a combination of balance and a good hand, eye, and ski coordination. When entering the jib, it's all about balance. You have to be balanced going into it, balanced across the center, and balanced coming out. Tempting fate, Hibbert decides to go without a helmet on this day. But sometimes a helmet isn't the piece of safety equipment you need. <laughs> Scott likes to live on the edge, but this is one edge he could have done without. I'd say the number one rule on any jib is keep your legs closed. Traveling 25 miles per hour, Scott approaches the rail from behind. He pops up and gets good air over the rail, but instead of doing a 90-degree turn to safely land sideways on his skis, he rotates a full 180. With his skis out of position, he has no choice but to use something else to land on. That's got to be the worst groin shot I've ever seen. Uh, you okay? In the world of stunt skiing, rail jumping may be low on the degree of difficulty scale, but Scott Hibbert found out on the scale of pain and suffering, it's off the charts. Street bike stunt jockeys. They're a breed of daring athletes who rev their engines just a little faster than the rest of us. Racing high octane machines of muscle, metal, and chrome. They scream down the asphalt, danger-seeking risk-takers, putting their lives and their bodies on the line every day. But sometimes, stunt riding can be a sport of grace and beauty. Here at Lakeland, Florida's International Speedway, Josh and his girlfriend, Megan, show us another side of this sport, a more artistic side. While most of us know only the wild and rowdy nature of stunt riding, Josh and Megan manage to make it look elegant and refined. But no matter how poised and polished these two may be, it takes just a thing called gravity to remind us that all stunt biking has one thing in common. As she's let off the track, Megan will take away an experience she'll never forget, along with an extreme case of road rash. But she'll never lose the attitude you've got to have to make your mark in this sport. That's all good. You learn. You learn up from your mistakes. You live, you learn. It was fun. All that. <laughs> They call it mountain boarding, or dirt boarding, or ATBing, or sometimes just MOBO. 
but by whatever name you choose, it's one of the fastest growing extreme sports in all the world. Invented in California in the early 90s, mountain boarding was originally intended as a way for snowboarders to get some off-season thrills and spills. But since then, extreme athletes from across the action sports spectrum have been falling all over themselves to get in the game. If this young sport has a superstar spokesman, it would have to be a Kony Kama. Akoni started his pro career as a skateboarder, but soon discovered that his free-spirited ways were much more suited for the wide-open spaces of the ATB circuit. Since making the switch to mountain boarding, Akoni has racked up over a dozen world titles, co-headlined several sold-out motocross stadium tours, consulted on major motion pictures, and was the first dirtboarder to ever pull off the double backflip. Despite his fame, on any given weekend, you can still see a Kony Kama's trademark dreadlocks flying down some mountain somewhere, inspiring newcomers and wannabes. Here, through the use of our exclusive Sports Crash Akoni Cam, you get some idea of what it's like to fly down a rocky trail at upwards of 35 miles per hour. Of course, even the most celebrated ATBers of his generation still eats his fair share of dirt lunches. But there's one fall Akoni can't forget, no matter how much he'd like to. Perth, Australia. It's the final night of another sold-out Pan Pacific tour. Akoni has already performed the one double back flip for which he was contractually obligated. But the fans want more. And like any great performer, Akoni Kama didn't reach the top by disappointing his fans. What he never counted on was this. Let's hear what happened from the man himself. I sure got a little excited. Told uh, Mad Mike, who's my good buddy, you know, toes me all the time. He's super consistent and on it. I told him to go a little faster because I wanted to land deeper in the tranny for the trick. And I just went too hard and I was thinking two jumps ahead of what I was doing. Just, you know, got too excited and just overshot the landing. Miraculously, despite a high speed fall over three stories, Akoni Kama escaped with only some bruised ribs and a shattered humerus bone. But there's nothing humorous about a spill like this. Some in Kama's inner circle suggest that at age 36, maybe it's time to hang up the dirt board. But for Akoni Kama, such suggestions go in one ear and out the other. Coming up on Sports Crash. An unbelievable car wreck. And rocking and rolling, a truck goes way off course. That's up next. We're back on Sports Crash, the show that walks the heart racing line between success and disaster. Drop in and hang on. Rally car racing is a high-speed test of reflexes and skill. Specially built street legal machines compete in a sport that's distinguished not by running on an enclosed track, but by fearlessly barreling along public roads. These reckless roadsters must navigate uneven layouts, avoid sudden obstacles on the course, and expertly navigate tight hairpin turns. The most experienced drivers engage not only in a race for first place, but often a battle for their lives. And it's not always the drivers who face the most risk, with fans allowed to get up close and personal to these exhaust spewing spectacles. They sometimes find themselves a bit too close to the action. Show up at one of these events, you better know the number one rule, pay attention or pay the ultimate price. On a recent summer afternoon in Surrey, England, it was a good day for rally car racing. A bad day to be a photographer. Watch closely as two tons of metal horrifyingly barrel rolls off course, just missing this cameraman. With car parts and other photographers scattered about the grounds, miraculously, no one is injured. 
and a very lucky cameraman learned that in a blink of an eye or a click of a shutter, everything can come into focus. Vancouver, Canada. A group of best buds and stunt rider wannabes are spending a warm afternoon honing their skills. A homemade ramp and a neighborhood pond provide the perfect setting to practice their passion. Stunts like these build cred with your crew. But Josh Berman, the one who came up with this idea, is about to get his reputation slammed. As Josh jumps, his wheels fly out from under him. Separated from his ride, he has no choice but to follow it into the water. But as he pounds into the pond, he slams into the bike. Luckily, he didn't hit his head and he's still conscious. But beneath the surface, the searing pain is starting to set in. It's real bad. Josh's right knee ah. took the full force of the impact. His friends snap into action and immediately send for help. As paramedics tend to the fallen rider, Josh tries to make sense of what just happened. Banged up pretty bad, Josh is carefully placed in the ambulance. His friends give him a send-off they know their bud would appreciate. Yeah. Oh, the siren! Yeah! yeah. What a loser! <laughs> Trucks are an integral part of society, the workhorses of modern civilization. They do the heavy lifting on our nation's highways. But for some nitro-fueled fanatics, trucks represent full-throttle exhaust belching competition. In the modified pickup class, the best in the world have gathered in El Cajon, California for the Off-Road World Championships. Moments after pulling away from the starting line, Scott Douglas's number seven Ford F-150 becomes a victim of rush hour traffic. In spite of the intense violence of the crash, luckily, Douglas survives to tell us about it. I got clobbered by, uh, I think, an orange truck and uh, just sent. I clearly had a hole shot. There's no doubt about it. And I got clobbered. Sent cartwheeling at 100 miles an hour. Clobbered is putting it mildly. Here's how it breaks down in our Sports Crash Spotlight. Coming into the first turn, the orange truck lets it float out a little too wide, causing contact with Douglas's right side. The white Ford gets bumped onto its left two wheels. Another truck decided that he could make that corner using the other truck to slow him down. Impact and speed combine to send the two and a half ton vehicle up and over the barrier and into a shattering series of rolls. Oh, Douglas over the barriers, onto the other part of the track, multiple tumbles. They need to start parking people because we're professionals out here. We run hard, we run fast lap times. Don't need idiots clocking people at 100 miles an hour because somebody's going to get killed. And I could have been in. If you've ever experienced road rage, you know how Scott Douglas feels. Skydiving videographer Tim Bernard never met a death-defying challenge he couldn't capture on tape. We're uh, on the shuttle bus, right, B, over to uh, Mike Mullins King Air, uh, where we're ready to uh, do this hangar fly-through stunt. His latest, to attempt what skydivers call a simple cut through these hangar doors. Guiding your chute in and out of a concrete structure obviously comes with considerable risk. Of course, taking chances is this daredevil's reason for getting up in the morning. I should be able to pull this up. Hang tight, we'll see you out there. Yeah. But today, as Tim takes off into the wild blue, this thrill-seeking videographer will come perilously close to videotaping his own demise. If I crash, make sure you guys don't shy away. Turn on the cameras, because if I'm going to crash, I want it on tape, big time, OK? From a dizzying height of 11,000 feet, Tim has his target in sight, and it's go time. Using the cables on his chute to deftly guide his way, he quickly descends upon his objective, all the while his camera's rolling, documenting every harrowing second. 
what should have been a simple cut nearly cost Tim his consciousness. Zooming in at 65 miles per hour, Tim has to navigate through the 37-foot high, 250-foot wide hangar opening. Needing to approach at a 42-degree angle so he can make his turn, he turns too tight and his chute hits the hangar door. The collision slams Tim the final 10 feet down into a crash landing on the unforgiving concrete floor. That's what it looks like to go from 65 to zero inside a concrete hangar. The impact leaves Tim's broken body in a heap, writhing in pain. I broke something. Lay still. Oh, yeah. Lay still. Don't move. Don't move. Lay still. OK. Not too pretty, was it? Well, it wasn't. And I got busted up pretty bad. The brutal body blow shatters Tim's hip in seven places. Had to undergo a 10-hour surgery, losing nine and a half pints of blood. Uh, got a seven-inch steel plate, five-inch steel plate, and 33 screws and something like 65 staples. Wearing his wounds like a badge of courage, this videographer will live to jump again. Well, at least I'm still alive. And he'll always have this horrifying tape to remind him of the exciting but dangerous choice he's made for his life's work. That's it for another Sports Crash, where we bring you sportsmen precariously walking that fine line between survival and disaster.